Hey guys, Rob Skiba here with the final part in my Seed, a Filmmaker's Journey series. If you have seen parts one and two already, you know what a long road it has been getting here. Of course, cramming over a decade worth of experiences into less than four hours means all I could do was give you the highlights. There were obviously many more people who have come and gone and who have played a part in this journey that I didn't have time to include. And just as many, if not more, exciting experiences too. Even though those things didn't make the cut for this series, I hold them all very near and dear in my heart, and I wish to thank everyone who has supported this project during this long, adventurous, enlightening, educational, and often difficult journey. I know I don't say it often enough, but I sincerely appreciate everyone who has believed in us and who has in some way contributed to the success of this project over the years. We couldn't have done it without you. And now, thanks to your support, in this video, I'm proud to be able to present our first completed TV project. It's called Seed Paradise Lost, but it's only about eight minutes long. While the finished project is short in duration, it took a whole lot of time and effort to make. So I want to take this time to show you exactly what it took to create it. As mentioned in the previous video, each Seed television script consists of a teaser and five acts. The teaser is typically a short segment that sets the stage for the rest of the episode. It plays right before the opening title credits for the show. Then each act is what plays after the commercial breaks. In 2019, I made the decision to just start shooting each segment as I get the required funding to do so. If I were to get the entire budget, then great, we just go ahead and shoot the entire episode. Otherwise, I decided I'd just do what I can, when I can, however I can. So when I received the $100,000 donation, we immediately got to work on the animated CGI version of the teaser for episode one, which would be based on the comic book I had just released of the same content and which would serve as our storyboard. At the end of part two, I showed you how the trip I made to South Africa back in 2012 brought us full circle seven years later, nearly to the day, culminating in me making a trip back to Cape Town in December of 2019. Mornay had set me up with a beautiful beach house hotel room for my stay there. He showed me around Cape Town and brought me to Johan's studio, where I would finally get to meet the entire South African team in person. Johan Funderkopf was my producer and the one responsible for assembling the team, so it seems only fitting that I should start this video off with the interview that I did with him when I was there. Uh, Johan, tell us uh, about Post City and a little bit about yourself, and then how did you get involved in this project? Sure. Basically, Post City, um, I started uh, around about four or five years ago. Hmm. The idea was to bring people from the industry together that's kind of left the commercial facilities and uh, went out to do their own thing, um, but they lack infrastructure. Mm. So we tried to put some infrastructure together to bring the guys together in a facility and facilities across the world where they can service international clients with the stability of a big facility, studio kind of infrastructure, but you have the top of the range, um, independent mm. people working behind the scenes. Um, with regards to Seed, um, Mornay, who's a, a brilliant actor, editor, I know we have a multi-talented uh, guy that I've met on a, on a previous uh, film that we worked on a few years ago. Um, he introduced me uh, to yourself, uh, mm -hmm. I think almost three years ago now. I think uh, so, Two yeah, to three, three years ago, yeah. And uh, loved the project then and mm. uh, loved when it came back. Uh, he initially contacted uh, me for the audio side of things. Mm -hmm. um, and when we got a chatting, I passed it to him, look, we have a fantastic animation team um, mm -hmm. within the group. And uh, yeah, from there, here we are. Yeah. So uh, you seem to have a talent for uh, attracting other talent. You're my, you're my South African producer here. Mm -hmm. you're, you've assembled an amazing team for, for this project. So w what did that look like? How did that come about? Yeah. So over the last uh, two <coughs> years, we've been working quite a few international and local films. And um, I met Hilton through another director, which we were busy with in another project. Mm. And um, we just really clicked when we met the first time. And uh, I've, inv I've invited him out here. And he loved the stage and he loved what we were busy with here mm. and immediately wanted to work together. Oh, wow. And um, we, we, yeah, we've been pitching on quite a few projects together um, from the animation and VFX side on their side. They ended up joining the Post City Network. Um, we have mm. a little program that you guys can join with. And uh, yeah, I just felt that it's the right person, the right um, talent, but also the right personality. Mm -hmm. At the end of the day, when I assemble a team, I don't just look at what they've achieved, but mm. really on if their personality matches the mm. director that we're going to work with, mm. the project we're going to work with, um, because we all work in such a close proximity to one another that uh, we can't have egos clashing mm. and those kind of things. 
And the same with Morna. I met him through another colleague of mine um, that is a, is a great composer. And he brought Morna here um, mm. for a visit again to see the stage. Um, this being the only Atmos uh, stage in Africa, mm. um, came to have a listen to some of the projects we've done. Uh, and then Morna brought another project here to come and final mix. Mm. And, uh, and again, I just listened to some of the work he's been doing. And again, coming from an audio background myself, mm. I was impressed. Uh, it was, uh, it might sound vain, but it was on a level that I thought, look, this is matching what I do. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, even better in certain ways. So um, when this project came about, uh, you know, it was really just, it's easy to pick up the phone. Mm. I knew exactly which personalities were gonna match this project. Um, mm. Again, from Orne's side, the previous f um, project that the mixed year, uh, the same time, not the same time genre, but again, the fighting, the mm. gunshots, the, the movement, the atmospheres. With Seed, I think a lot, you know, f except for the fantastic visuals that, we'll be, that, that Hilton's creating in the team, the sound design mm. for me is always 50%. Yeah. Um, I mean, sometimes we want to be a little vain and say it's 60% of the film <laughs> because you tend to, people tend to pick up easier when there's an audio problem with the project than mm -hmm. the visual project. But at the end of the day, that conveys the emotion and the sound makes you feel like you're there. Mm. Um, it, it's almost adding that immersive element without having the 3D visual glasses kind of thing on. And, um, and for me, again, the team was that. It's getting the right people in. I mean, Edward, that you've also uh, mm. had a chat with on the music side of things. We've composed on a few films together. And again, it's, you know, it's that emotion that we want to create. Mm -hmm. um, reading your story, getting a bit to know about who you are and your mm -hmm. background, and just trying to bring people together. That's really going to, without, again, without any judgment to one another, everyone has different, you know, views and life. Mm -hmm but we all can work together and bring seed to life. Mm -hmm. Yeah, let's talk about Edward a little bit. I, I said I wanted to make this epic. I wanted Hans Zimmer, you know, bl uh, was it Blake Neely, I think, uh, the television. Uh, yeah. And I said the the uh, t t television series Arrow, that's the music I love. And you're yeah, like, yeah. okay, yeah, I got the guy. Uh, so yeah, talk to me a little bit more about Edward and, and what he brings to the table. Sure. Because you, you said to me something along the fact that, You've worked with some of the best, including Zimmer, and you're like, this kid, he's amazing. Yeah, look, I think, I mean, I, again, I met him as well on a, on a previous project. Um, he just came out of college, mm. and um, I brought him board to do some orchestration for the score that I was composing. Mm. And uh, starting to work together, I just, I just could, could feel that this kid's talent is just, it's, mm. it's above. You yeah. know, I mean, I mean you, you work with a lot of people uh, over the years, and sometimes you just feel Mm -hmm. um, and uh, and I think yeah again with music, it is a language, mm -hmm. and you need to learn to to speak that language. Yeah. And some people are just born with that talent. Um, some people can learn it, and can become fantastic. But some people are absolutely born with that talent. And I think mm -hmm. Edward is one of those guys, um, where he just understands the picture. He understands the timing, mm -hmm. um, and and he is so multifaceted because I mean we've done stuff from Africa to Bollywood. Mm. Uh, to to the big orchestral kind of stuff, uh, the Zimmer kind of stuff that you were talking about, yeah. and uh, again, he's that multifaceted talent that he has to really go from any type of genre, like some of the biggest guys in the world. You know that um, I think he's heading in that direction. Mm. Given the right networking opportunities, um, he will he will definitely be making some some notes in future. Yeah, love having him on board. The whole team has been amazing. When I first started speaking with Mornay and Johan about this project, they were both very confident that they could assemble the right team for the job. And I gotta say, they were right. So it was about seven years almost to the day ago yeah. that wow. you brought me to the same place. This Back full circle. What was the name of the studio at that time? It was Waterfront Studios. Waterfront Studios. Yes, and now it's called Silverline Studios and Refinery, but it's a few different production companies using it now. Using the same facility? Yeah, so Refinery, Silverline Studios. And right over there, there's a sign called Cedar. Look at that right there. And we're sitting here at Synergistics. I'm with Matthew Kearney. And uh, Matthew, tell us a little bit about what you guys are working on here behind us. We are working on Seed. Uh, we're generating uh, layout, trees, uh, the river. Um, we've been modeling the Avenger, getting all the turret uh, bits inside. 
a lot of the interior detail has been added, UVing, uh, preparing it for texturing and look dev. We're uh, preparing the Avenger to be the crashed version as well, so that we can very much art direct once the plane is crashed, what the look of it is, uh, making sure that the bullet holes will hold up when your camera is very close to the aircraft, uh, and setting up uh, the river simulation so that we can have high detail simulation around the aircraft and where the characters are and then the lower res simulation happening further from the aircraft. Uh, we're preparing the, the lighting so that we can uh, accurately change the lighting from the golden hour, that amazing sunset, through to the darkness. Right. Uh, and then obviously craft the lighting so that when it is dark you don't lose too much detail. That mm. there perhaps there's some moonlight uh, uh, enough to just have good cues for what's going on. Yeah. Um, so we're, pre we're preparing mostly uh, a lot of the, the scenery, the crash site. Uh, we're getting everything in place so that once the animation starts full ball, we can, we can go full tilt with everything. Uh, put the characters in the scenes and they'll be dressed and ready to go. Closest to the window is Mara, who's a asset team, so he's modeling, texturing. He does a bit of uh, look dev as well, creating shaders and uh, text uh, lighting the objects. Uh, he's busy working on the Avenger at the moment. Uh, he's, a, he's the lead on the Avenger. And he's collected a ton of reference so that we're doing it uh, so it's done right. So uh -huh. it matches what was, was done at that time. Uh, next to him are Adrian and Lee, and uh, Lee's busy working on the bullet system so that we can completely art direct where the bullet hits mm. uh, happen, uh, how many bullets uh, are fired, the length of the traces, how, how, how often you see the traces. Mm. And we'll be adding a little system to texture bomb where the bullet hits happen so that you see varying sort of detail of types of bullet holes, uh, the damage around the bullet holes. We want it to be, when you get close up, that you see that detail. And we want it to be procedural as well so that you can art direct it to your heart's content. Right, so you're saying we can create a path whatever direction we want exactly. the bullets to go in. So on a shot-by-shot -shot basis, we can draw a path mm -hmm. and determine how fast the bullets move across that path. How many points there are on the path will be where the bullet hits happen on that path. So Fantastic. it's a nice system. And then behind there is Tammy. She's working on the, uh, the terrain. Mm -hmm. So she generated from open source uh, uh, height maps, mm -hmm. from Google Earth data, we, we, we've accurately modeled the crash site in the Solomon Islands. Yeah. Uh, so it, it is true to um, what is currently there. Um, so we'll have various uh, levels of detail. So when you're at the crash site, we've got a very high detail, very high res section. But when the plane is further out, we've got sort of the LOD um, variation so that when you're quite high up, you still have the full Solomon Islands, which are mm -hmm. generated from terrain data. So it's all accurate. It's, it's all the actual island shape and the, the right height of mountains, etc. That's fantastic. Yeah. And thanks to Houdini, we were able to do that. And also, yeah, yeah. Uh, Allegra is busy working on some of the color scripts, uh, the matte painting of the um, panorama of the, the sunset from the aircraft in, in the sky. And we'll obviously work out with you the varying levels of lighting from where the sun starts to where it dips down behind the horizon and, and gets dark. Yeah. And we want that to be directable as well, as, as much as art directable as possible. Mm -hmm. And then the other Matthew is handling all the, the fluid sims at the moment, setting it up, making sure that we're at the right scale so that the sims, uh, the sims scale is accurate so that we get a, a reliable result from the simulations. Mm -hmm. And for then like the river movement and all that kind and of stuff. And any water interaction. Mm -hmm. And obviously for when the plane crashes, that's a big yeah. one. That's the, that's the money shot right there. That is the money shot. Because that plane's going to crash like an inch in front of the camera. And it's going to splash water. And that'll make for an, a nice cut to the next shot as well. Right. Yeah, yeah. And then we're obviously uh, also having to set up the pyrosim. So once the plane is crashed and it's starting to catch the light. Fire, yeah. And we, that's also quite nicely directable because Houdini has an option for spreading pyro fire. So nice. it'll start out small and it, yeah, by the time he... Way gets away from the plane, it'll be well on fire <laughs> for the explosion, indeed. And then next to him is Ruan, who's the zebra sculptor, who's at the moment sculpting the detail on the Japanese soldiers. Mm -hmm. And we're going off the reference that you supplied and a, yeah. a few other references we found as well. So they w will hopefully be very accurate for that period as well. Very nice. So what's the uh, pipeline of software that you're using specifically for this project? 
Uh, at the moment, we're Windows based, uh, and we obviously use ZBrush for modeling, uh, Substance Painter for texturing, and Mari for texturing. Mm -hmm. And Mari is great in that it handles very large, uh, high detailed meshes. Um, then we use Maya as our intermediate uh, app for um, some modeling, uh, UVing, uh, and for rigging and animation. And then the app that handles the heavy load is Houdini. Mm. Uh, everything ends up in Houdini, it's our scene assembly. We do our lighting and look dev in that, all our effects, and when it comes to rendering, we push everything out through Houdini as well. Uh, and then at the end of the pipeline, we have Nuke for compositing and Flame for the finishing. Mm. So Nuke is great in, in that it's a, it's a workhorse. Uh, it's great for putting everything together. And then with Flame, you've just got those few extra tools at the end for the polish. Mm. Um, and when you're delivering from Flame as well, you know that you're getting the highest quality uh, pixels you can get. I've been at Synergistic for two years, and uh, it's run by Hilton, who's been in this uh, industry for 30 years or more. Um, in fact, I think he was one of the people who started the very first visual effects house in South Africa. Oh, wow. He went on to um, help start the refinery, mm. and then later Black Ginger, where I worked as well for nine years with Hilton there. Um, I'm CG supervisor, so I sort of run the studio and make sure the guys have the tools they need. I do some of the work as well. Um, and myself and Hilton are very excited to be working this because it, it's not often you get to do a, a full CG, mm. um, interesting and engaging story that has nice bits to do. So there's simulation, there's lots of look dev, um, there's the modeling of period accurate pieces, you know, it, it's the kind of job that the artists like to work on, mm. which uh, means that they, they enjoy the work, so they, they do it happily, <laughs> uh, and they do it well, and, uh, and f from our side it's nice to do because it, it's going to be a great piece for our showreel, it's going to be, it's going to look amazing, it's a good story, yeah. and I think it's going to generate a lot of interest. Yeah, all so right. So we're excited, yeah. Awesome. <laughs> I'm excited too. We'll have Allegra paint up color scripts for most of the frames, and which we'll send to you to view as well, which will just help us yeah. uh, nail down the kind of lighting look as, as soon as possible as well. Yeah, and you said like this damage and all, that's all customizable. For, yes, absolutely. So yeah. Dial it down, dial it up. As we yeah, should. and we'll add obviously the, the, the smoke stain across the front, the oil right. um, streaks, and wherever the bullets are, the, the, the little patches and chip paint areas all over yeah. the area as well. So that's on the shots where we're close and on the plane and where he's jumping with the wings, that'll all look mm -hmm. sort of nice and high res. And, uh, we, we, we're looking at pictures of what the banks of the river actually look like. So we want it to be as accurate as possible. That's great. Yeah. So who's working on the lizard? Uh, oh, Ruin as well. Oh yeah, and ZBrush? Yeah. yeah. Have you got uh, this, the stink available? I cannot even begin to express in words how exciting that was for me. Everyone there was so talented and very happy to be working on the project. So if, if we do this right, the way the credits will roll, oh, you know, because we fade the black after this last shot here, kind of a slow fade the black, credits start rolling, but as the credits are rolling, the black is slowly starting to open up to whatever the ambient light would be for, for this. Then you start seeing the other lights come that will illuminate it for the final, and then to be continued. Okay. Mm -hmm. Nice cliffhanger. Yeah. This sequence here, the Kandahar Giant, that's what's going to happen in Act 1 after the teaser. So, Special Forces Troop actually encountered a 12 foot cannibalistic red haired giant in Kandahar, Afghanistan in 2002. And so I'm going to depict that, and that's what prompts the military to create. His special forces like Ghostbusters division, mm -hmm. so like the X Files of the special forces. Oh wow! So that's, that's what the scene will represent in that regard. So it's a huge project, and hopefully, what we're doing here will be used to raise the funds to, to go into production on the rest of the series. Yeah, we'll do our best. Yeah, I know you will. You guys are already doing amazing work. So thank you so much. Finally, I had a team of dedicated professional artists, which is what you get when you actually have a budget albeit still a comparatively small one. Normally a production like this would have cost three times as much as I paid. Thankfully, the team in South Africa was willing to work well below the going rate because they shared my vision of what Seed could become 
and thus they were willing to take a chance and sew into it. What a blessing. I had already created the CGI version of my characters in a free software called Daz 3D. On their website, you can buy high-quality models, which are fully customizable. So you, you can basically create any look you want. You can use existing characters or use the various tools to modify them and create a custom look, and that's what I did. These were the characters I created for the teaser. But we need lots of other props and models, too, some of which I had and provided to them. Others had to be created from scratch. When I went there to visit at their studio, they already had a lot of the modeling done and would finish up the rest shortly thereafter. I gave them my comic book, which again, I had worked with my artist to create each frame in the way I envisioned directing the scenes. So effectively, the comic book served as our storyboard. And as you can see, I think they did a really good job of conveying exactly what was in my head. The lesson being, good pre-planning leads to good end results. With my CGI characters already created, we needed actors to bring them to life. My producer began to send me audition clips to listen to from a variety of South African actors that he was bringing to the table. I had written some background history for each character and had certain attributes I was looking for, and after hearing several audition samples, I selected the actors who I thought had the best potential. Johan then scheduled for me to do live callback auditions with them via Skype. I chose Dylan Skews to play Catalano, my tail gunner, and Matthew Gardner to play the radio operator. But we still didn't have our lead yet. Then my friend Mornay Tennyson and Johan recommended a popular up-and-coming South African actor named Greg Creek. Greg was in the U.S. doing movies, but he had to go back to Cape Town right around the same time that I was going to be there. He literally did his audition the same day I was about to fly out. <laughs> he nailed the audition, and uh, we just really connected one-on-one. -on -one. So at the last minute, I had my lead character, and soon I was on my way to South Africa to work with the actors and the rest of the team. Hi there. Uh, my name is Dylan Skews, and I play the character Catalano in the new feature animation Seed, Paradise Lost. Um, Catalano is a gunner in World War II, um, which to me is exciting as anything. Um, he's, a, he's an American, the New York uh, accent. Um, yeah, it's been super fun to play. Uh, we did an audition process um, in the beginning, which we sent through a few voice clips to the director. The only way you can conquer me is if you kill me. <laughs> and you better bring a whole army to even think about slowing me down, let alone kill me. And uh, he shortlisted us. Then we, yeah, then I got chosen for the role. Uh, we did a few rehearsals with the director. Uh, in which he Skyped us and just tweaked our characters a bit and our accents and just helped these characters come to life. Yeah, okay, New Yorkers, you know, especially a character like this, he's like, you want some yes. of this? You know, come on. You want right? some of this? Huh? Yeah, <laughs> okay, you want some of this? You know, bring it on, right? Yeah, yeah. The process of this is uh, actually very different from normal voiceovers than I have done in the past. Uh, you know, usually you're in a booth with a microphone in front of you and you just got to read your, read your bit. Uh, but in this case, we actually have a um, motion sensor uh, all over us, like these little sticky dots all over our face that can capture our emotions, uh, which is interesting. Um, you know, it, uh, it's just a different way of doing things, and I think the final product's going to turn out awesome. Oh, oh my goodness. <laughs> have to get it on camera, man. <laughs> hey, I'm Matt. I'm doing the voice for Thompson. And uh, this is a really interesting process actually finding out about this job through a friend of mine that said I needed to contact these guys and that this was happening. And um, yeah, before I knew it, I was auditioning online with Rob Skibber and uh, we were hashing through the script. And just a question for you there, I'm not too familiar with, with the accent I'm going for. Would I say data or data? Yeah, data would be better. Okay, yeah, gotcha. Data. data. This, this data, data gets into the wrong hands. Yeah. Okay, cool. And, you know, it's always, you don't know if you've nailed it or not, and then got a call a while after, and here I am, and it's, it's been quite cool to do voiceover for animation, but not just for animation, it's being tracked, the actual motion on the face is being captured, and that's going to be amazing to see afterwards how it transpires, and just to be part of something that's been a comic, an audio drama, written by such a talented individual, and I'm really looking forward to seeing the final product. Hey, it's Greg Crick, and I had the awesome privilege of getting to play Lieutenant Kane in Seed Paradise Lost, written and directed by Rob Skiba. 
Man, Lieutenant Kane is your all-American flyboy. He is a skilled pilot, a natural leader, and being an actor, this was like a dream role. Like, an absolute kid in a candy store from the time that I auditioned to the time that we actually shot. Um, yeah, Rob just did such an epic job of taking something that was historical, creating such rich and diverse characters, thrusting them in this incredible world, and allowing us as, as, as actors to, to get to play in this epic world um, and getting to work um, in a mocap setting um, in this incredible animated series was, was, was a dream come true, seriously. Like, we had so much fun. Uh, when I heard about the audition, I was just like, man, i got to, I got to put my all into this. And uh, it was so rad to just get the confirmation to, to get to play um, Kane. Um, and getting to work with Rob personally just before he flew out to South Africa where we did the shoot. Um, it was amazing. I mean, I think, I believe what you've got here is for sure, like, relevant and on the money. Yeah, thank it's you. It's awesome. Yeah, thank you. step in the right direction, for sure. Like, I really feel like we had a great chemistry and getting to hear Rob's vision and getting to play within that world. And then once we got to set on the day and getting to meet the other actors and just getting to see what everyone else brought to the table, it just forged this this chemistry and the whole team the whole production team including rob everyone just like rocked up and just wanted to do something that we all can be proud of and i'm immensely proud of of, of everything that that the guys put together um and it was such a unique experience i must say like mocap is such a different world it's one thing to be on the other side of the cameras but being in the hot seat on the day and getting to work with all those mocap dots that that capture all your nuances that capture your emotions that was really, really cool. Um, and like I said earlier, you know, like like being like a kid, you know, getting to play in this this imaginative but also historical world um, was, was incredible. Really getting to exercise the imagination and working off everybody on the day, um, it was super, super cool. Um, it gets hard under those lights though, and like having all those cameras around you um, is quite an experience. Um, but yeah, it was fun. It kind of felt like jumping off the ledge and knowing that you could have a, a director and a leader in Rob that, yeah, you felt comfortable with. Um, and he was able to, it was amazing to see how he worked with each of us as the actors and how he was able to draw performances out of each of us. Yeah. Yeah. And we'd all run that one if you okay. like. Focus on art. <laughs> focus on it. Focus on it. Yeah. Remember, it's a silent T. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and it was also really refreshing getting to work with a director who really, really knew what he wanted. It's not a difficult plane to fly, so you don't have to echo okay, it's, like, yeah, it's like, yeah. it's like, uh, you know, it's like, it's not hard to turn. I mean, gotcha. it's, it flies pretty smooth. Cool. Uh, except for when we're going down at that point, and you've lost some measure of control, and it's, you know, you're going down. Cool. So I'm super excited for the project. I can't wait for audiences to, to get to see this. Um, just having seen the previews and the... Um, yeah, just the, the storyboards of what this project's going to be. It's going to be epic. So combining that technology, combining post-production technology with the mocap, with the performances, with the music and sound design, and with the director and writer in Rob, it's, it's going to be fantastic, man. As soon as the actors arrived at the studio, I got the updated scripts to them, and then we went off into the break room to run lines and do a couple rehearsals. All right, and from the top of the scene, action. We're turning into Swiss cheese! I know, I know, I've got a misfire, Peter's jam! Thompson, can you get a shot? No, he's too high! I can't get up! I'm losing her! Brace yourselves, we're, we're going down! Fantastic. Great job, guys. Really good. I'm like crazy super excited right now. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Meanwhile, in the main auditorium, the Synergistics crew were setting up all the motion capture cameras and lights under the supervision of Hilton Treves. And uh, I can't even begin to tell you how excited I am to have him on board with this project. He comes with a wealth of experience and knowledge and uh, a pretty extensive background in the visual effects field. I'll put the links in the description below if you want to check out more of his bio, but he's the founder of Synergistics. With over 27 years of experience, Hilton's areas of expertise include visual effects supervision, VFX direction, LiDAR scanning, cyber scanning, aerial LiDAR scanning, and virtual reality development. His recent long-form projects include the visual effects supervisor for the Disney ABC series of Kings and Prophets, on-set supervisor for Scott Stewart, Dominion, 
and Adam Sandler's Blended, uh, among other projects. You can check out all the awards he's won on the right-hand side there. I mean, just a ton of experience. You can go to his IMDb page and scroll down and just look at some of his recent projects, some of the highlights here. London Has Fallen, Blended, The Giver, Tomb Raider, just to name a few. Of course, you can scroll down and see uh, you know, how many other TV shows and movies he's been involved with. Uh, working on the visual effects and as VFX supervisor and whatnot. And uh, check this out. This is his demo reel. When Johan first told me about Hilton, he sent me to his Vimeo page and I looked at a bunch of his demos, this being one of them. And uh, I mean, just check this stuff out. Look, I mean, set extensions and creation of tents and things that horses, all kinds of things that aren't really there. Uh, you know, clearly with this level of expertise and creativity, Hilton and his team are the perfect match for this project. Uh, I mean, you know, this is like having South Africa's industrial light and magic working on my project. Uh, you know, I'm, I've cut this down just a little bit for the purpose of this video right here. You can check out the full version on um, his Vimeo page, but yeah. Very, very excited. So now I'll take you to the interview that I did with him while we were on site doing the motion capture. I've been in the business for 31 years and I started the very first animation studio in South Africa, mm -hmm. 1989, and pretty much had the privilege of working with some of the most incredible talent uh, this country's ever generated and created, mm -hmm. and still do. So. We've been around and uh, animation and visual effects has been a passion of mine pretty much since uh, George Lucas uh, put Star Wars up on the screen. I think a lot yeah, of us got that into that. We could all say that probably. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, uh, yeah, great. Yeah, yeah. So I'm very excited to have you on board with this well, project. Thank, thank you. you so much for coming on board. Yeah. How did you, how did that come about? How did you find out about this project? And well, Johan uh, came to me and uh, said to me, I've got to show you something, which is incredible. And we read it and we wow. Okay, this is the, this could be something that has uh, got such longevity legs and and it's incredibly dynamic and um, it's the kind of project that we love. You know, it's the kind of thing we get involved with and when we do, it's uh, it's all in or nothing. You know, and uh, I think the team is also incredibly excited by it. So mm. that 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 for me is always a good indicator. Yeah, that was great yeah. for me also. Yeah. <laughs> it was very exciting yeah. to see a bunch of people that were just as excited about the project as, mm. as I am. That's, that's yeah. awesome. So um, a while back, I made the decision to do this 100% CGI. Um, uh, have you done stuff that was all CGI, or you yeah. do mostly do CGI no, we're, we're, mixture? We're a mixed discipline, but uh, the, the principles are identical. Whether you're shooting for CGI or whether you're shooting for live action or integration of the things, the way that you approach it, and the way that you shoot it, and the way that you you, you do things is you've got to come from a live action background. Mm -hmm. You know, there's there's a there's a lot of misconception in terms of oh because it's CGI we can do anything, mm -hmm. but yeah it does give you uh, all that flexibility. But there's a lot of things that come with that that basically take you into the realm of where you step outside a story mm -hmm. because you're not actually telling the story. You're showing what the technology can do. Mm -hmm. Whereas, like what you've now chosen to do on this particular thing, you're approaching it from a live action perspective and you, you're telling the story from a live action perspective in a historical way. Your medium mm -hmm. just happens to be CGI. Mm -hmm. It could very well be live action, could very well be in an actual jungle. Mm -hmm. But the technology today has risen to that sort of level that you are able to tell that story. And there are more flexible things that you can do. And you can get to camera angles. I mean, Lion King's a perfect example, mm -hmm. where you, you can find camera angles that live action guys wish they had, but they're still not breaking the principles of telling the story. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's where, where this particular project is, is that the ability to be able to tell the story and tell it in a way that is very much sort of contemporary to where things are at today. Yeah, yeah, very good. So what were we doing here today, and what are you going to do after? Okay, so I mean, basically what we were doing here today is based getting uh, face shape and information. And it's critical to the emotive factor of the story, being able to have uh, actors that who can actually go through the voiceover, go through the dynamics, go through the dialogue. And at the same time, we're capturing all the information around their face at this point in time to remap that to the CGI characters. Mm -hmm. And it's by doing that, we're able to take what the live action people were bringing to the party mm -hmm. and putting that into a computer graphic character, thus allowing the ability to have the human link between that and still buying into the emotive factor. So you're not, you're not creating a wall 
because it's just a visual that's over there, mm -hmm. you're now creating something which is a bonding moment in terms of the, the ability. So having the, the, the ability to capture the live action mm -hmm. and being able to then remap that to a CGI character then gives us that uh, capability and it gives you as a director the timing, the pace, the weight mm -hmm. of how something is going to be communicated, which in turn really and truly helps us so much because we're not trying mm -hmm. to guess what the face is going to be doing. Right. We know what it's doing and you as the director are happy with the performance. Mm -hmm. So it takes out a lot of middle ground type activity, but at the same time it gives us a, a really solid grounding in terms of weight and telling that story. Fantastic. Yep. When we first talked, we don't have a crazy budget on this project, mm. uh, but we were shooting for sort of a, a target level of quality, and yep. you threw out a movie that I'd never heard of before, Tintin. Mm -hmm. uh, talk to me a little bit about that. Well, I think t <clears throat> what was really great about Tintin is that you still knew you were in, in a CGI world, mm -hmm. but you bought the fact that it was grounded in reality, mm -hmm. the way the textures were, the way that the performances acted, and all of that kind of thing. And I think that's very much what uh, we're doing here. You know, we're going to be taking that, I mean, the, the, the level of CGI and the type of stuff that we're doing the, these days is already bordering on complete and utter realism. Mm -hmm. And there's also a problem that you have if you go too far down the realism side, uh, specifically within the, the limitations of where we're currently at, you have this thing which is called the Uncanny the Valley. valley yeah. And the Uncanny Valley is something which leaves your audience feeling a little bit uncomfortable. You walk mm -hmm. out of there and you go, something's not quite right and you just don't buy into the character. Mm. So by taking it to which would be 80% of the way, you're trying to take out that aspect of the uncanny mm. valley. And that then gives you the, uh, the audience to, accept, to be able to buy into the story and you're telling the story and you're not worrying about, oh my God, his face didn't work exactly right, etc. Mm. because the left muscle wasn't uh, going through there. There's thousands of expressions that you'll go through in a microsecond mm. in a human face. And if that's not right, you as a human will instantly tell that mm -hmm. that's not right. That's the same thing if you're looking at things like Jurassic Park, for example. Mm -hmm. Jurassic Park in the early ones still stands up today because nobody knows what a T-Rex looks like mm -hmm. and how that behaves. But the level of realism and texture and all of that mm -hmm. says to you that it's real. Mm -hmm. So I think that that's an, that's an important factor. We're not trying to be completely photoreal. Um, because we don't want to end up in that space. Mm. And also, to, uh, by going to the, what we call the 80% rule, right now we can get into a place very quickly and have something which looks really special and spectacular and still be able to tell the story without dropping into the uncanny valley. All right, boys, it's getting late. Got everything we need? Yeah, I think so. Okay, I'm heading back. All right, and finally, what excites you most about working on Seed? Well, I think that the the, the storyline, I think, is fantastic. I think the mythology that you've uh, brought into this in terms of the the giant creatures, mm -hmm. I think that's all the creature itself. I think that that's, that's fantastic. I think the opportunity um, in terms of a TV series or a feature mm -hmm. film down the line, in terms of taking it into that realm, and I think it's an incredibly uh, ambitious project, and uh, I like challenges, and uh, my team like challenges. Sometimes they, 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 they say, oh, it's a bit too challenging, but at the end of the day, they're passionate about what they want and what they're doing. Mm. And I think it's, uh, it's a phenomenal project, and I think uh, I'm really looking forward to seeing where and how we can take this and where it's going to go in future. Well, thank you, know? you so much. Thank you. really appreciate it. Cool. As mentioned in my interview with Johan, he also brought Mornay Moray on board as our sound designer and Edward King as our composer. And let me just say, I had a lot of fun working with both of these incredibly talented guys. Okay, you want some of this? Come and get it! My process so far has been trying to see how I can I kind of blend the orchestra and use the orchestra to really enhance like that side of the world also to give to um, just pay homage to, to the location and to the environment they're, they're in but also to kind of use it more as a sound design kind of um, yeah. aspect to to you know like intensify the, the, that, that, that airplane warfare and so on. Yeah so at this stage it's only the music that we're listening to here um, with Edward. Monet Marais is the sound designer and he's busy working on all the sound effects and then Johan van der Kolf will be doing the final mix and just blending and, and putting the surround sound mix in. And so when it comes together all at the end, it is going to sound epic. I mean, mm -hmm. I, just even listening to these little pieces you've <laughs> done now already, it's like, man, it makes me so excited about it. Thank you. <laughs> It's going to be really cool. 
So uh, I sent you a previs. Mm -hmm. You guys, you got that, and Edward started working on music. Mm -hmm. What's your relationship? How is sound design working with uh, with the music okay, and the so individuals? Yeah, well, um, <coughs> I'm I'm more focused on the sound effects, of course. But Edward and I, we have discussed, and we actually very excited to get going with this. Um, we're gonna try and see if we can create almost like the music and the sound design is gonna marry. Mm. And in some cases, we want to try new experiments where the sound actually morphs into the music and the music morphs into the sound, especially on high points of the film, like where the crash happens, mm. um, like the airplane sound, we're going to morph that maybe into the bass line. So the airplane will come and as it comes past with percussion and then it's like the bass of the, the music that actually goes past and then it mm. goes back to the airplane. So everything, yeah. the sound design, um, in that way, we have to design that it's on the same key and same notes than what the music is, mm -hmm. which is not tricky, but I mean, it's a little bit more fine tuning with the ear from the sound mm -hmm. design because you don't get to press notes on a keyboard with, with sound effects, you know, right. so we have to create them that say on the same. Yeah. Um, so how much of this are you creating from scratch or are you using <laughs> different libraries or a little bit of both? And um, so mm -hmm. I am one of those guys, I like to ke create my own stuff. Mm. So a lot of these things I've created, the only things that I can now tell is from a library is I bought a library of the airplanes that's used. Mm. So it's the real airplane. It's the actual sound that's of an Avenger airplane. Th and that's a the actual airplane. Yeah. Um, yeah, stuff like that. Yeah. Um, the monster sounds, I can't wait to start with actually, because <laughs> I bought software that actually creates sounds, but with your yeah. own voice. Yeah. So you, is your office in there? Or are you I'm actually in you Cape Town itself. Oh, okay. Yeah, they're in Cape Town, yeah. Oh, okay. yeah. You have your own studio set up? Over there? Yeah. <laughs> Like VC, like instrument packs, if that makes sense. Oh, yeah. So you got like libraries of different, like these are orchestra libraries. This is a cello library. Oh, and that's so cool. And stuff. Um, then obviously you get like from percussion to 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 everything else. Um, but it's, it's very cool. Incredibly lifelike as well. I mean. Oh, so you get you get samples for. No, no, you can use it. Um, and obviously, this is my favorite little toy. Uh, probably the best thing I've ever, <laughs> how can I say, like, bought in my whole life. <laughs> yeah, what's up, Ming the Merciless? That's, that's totally like Flash Gordon, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Do you remember that movie? Yeah. <laughs> Before your time, probably. No, but I, I still watched it. Yeah. I love it. As soon as they get into yeah. <laughs> I'm such a geek, I'll actually listen to that in my car. I have like it's like, it's like a half hour long soundtrack that yeah. the Queen did, you know. That's it. I mean I listen to so many um soundtracks, I mean my wife gets my car she's like, the heck you listen <laughs> to it's like flash cord. <laughs> Yeah, we'll have to see what the actual final cut looks yeah, like. Yeah, do see what it Because that's going to be quick, too, because we're going to show the thing kind of going out from the inside. We're looking at him pushing it forward, yeah. then cut the interior coming at us, and then the, the quick disconnects. The wire's coming. Uh, yeah. It's going to be frantic. Yeah. And then, I mean, it may be one of those things where we kind of just follow it. As it goes. Because right here, I just have it, like it's uh, as, as if it's dropping, dropping in the frame. It. Okay, yeah. But it may be more like we just kind of follow, follow it out. It. <laughs> you know? Yeah, that's it, because then the music intensity can definitely... Yeah, you can like, keep that go very on, uh, up. Keep the whole thing. This is a beautiful shot. You have a break as well mm -hmm. in the music to kind of hold it up to that point. You yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you back you build it up Every and break down and just... Maybe a blend from the percussion again. <laughs> Yeah. I was only in South Africa for about a week to oversee the acting session and give general direction to the team. By the time I got back to the States, they had taken the mocap data from the recording sessions we did with the actors and begun the process of translating it onto my 3D characters. But we had some problems with the rigging and the exports of the models I provided them, so they essentially had to recreate my characters, which is why the end product characters don't look exactly the same as the characters I initially created. But I'm still happy with them, and the Facial expressions and vocals worked out great. 
Next, we had to do body motion capture for the post-crash scenes with Lieutenant Kane and the characters he would end up interacting with on the ground. We have a system called the X-Sins mocap suit, which uh, is really um, very capable in the sense that you don't need cameras to capture the data. It uses tracking, uh, little trackers that are on the body uh, in the suit, uh, and wirelessly it, it sends the data. So we're not limited by um, a small volume that has to have cameras inside. So yeah, we had to dress Lee up in the suit and put the trackers on, and then we calibrate it because we have to measure um, his height, shoulder width, um, ankle height, all these sort of things. And then the, once calibration is done, we're free to do the motion capture. Um, the whole point of doing the motion capture is that we can get very broad strokes done very quickly. So where an animator would have to sit in blocking first, and get the basic positions of the character done, and then they'd refine the blocking and get it a little bit closer to what is needed, and then they'd go into curves, from the linear to curves, which is a whole refinement process, um, and then the polish, where they then polish it. That can take days just to get a simple action like um, jumping down off the wing into the water, opening up the hatch, whereas we very quickly have got those broad strokes done. So this enables the animators to layer on top of that. So when we start putting the, the, this into the rig and we start seeing the motion, if Rob say, says, oh, he likes the binging bit, can he, can, can he move a bit quicker after the fact? Uh, we can very quickly make those changes without having to go back to blocking. And uh, we can do it as an animation layer on top of the mocap. And it also frees up the animators to focus on the, fa the facial motion, uh, the, f the facial animation to get the emotion across. We're able to generate a lot of natural motion, like the little shoulder movements and the way the head moves very quickly. And because it's all moving in uh, together uh, and we're doing it in a single take, uh, you get very natural looking motion. When an, anim an animator sits, they can animate to a clip but they generally will focus on shoulders and get shoulders and then they focus on spine and then they focus so they have a methodical approach and at the end it all adds up to but it unless you have a team of ilm or disney animators available um, it can take a while to get to a natural looking motion and with motion capture we can have natural motion very quickly and thankfully the data that comes from Xsend is very clean, so very little cleanup has to be done in the sense of pops and jitter and noise. So then you get to spend more time crafting the animation and tweaking it, layering on top of it to get the movements the way you want them. Uh, and the technology is certainly getting to the point where we were able to set it up, calibrate and do the capture over two days, all the animation. Uh, if you were using an older Viacon system, just setting the cameras up alone is a day. Um, checking that the cameras are all working, that they point in the right direction, that your capture volume is right. That, that is a, lo a long process. For us, this becomes a lot more economical because my, I was able to set it up and, and uh, with one mocap artist, we were able to do it in its entirety in two days. A little bit of time has to be spent after the fact doing exporting to FBX and BVH, and then we will import that. And uh, So it's not in, all done in two days, but the, the capture is done in that time, which really is very quick. We've got a few pickup shots to do, hopefully to get the harness to get those natural motions when the giant lifts the people up. But other than that, we, we were able to get pretty much everything done in two days, which is great. The other advantage of the XN system is it's, it doesn't demand a hell of a lot from your system, so a lower end PC can actually do it quite, quite comfortably. So, all in all, yeah, it's a, it's a good system and it's, it works very well. Like the weirdest thing about it was trying to like visualize everything without really having the situations. Like, I must say the most complicated thing was just walking through water. Just to simulate waist high water, just have it walk without making you look robotic is like the most complicated thing I've found. That was fun. As we were well into production, nearing completion on the animation, we still didn't have any actors for the Japanese characters. 
Now, I had initially done the Japanese voices myself using Google Translate, but it turned out what I was saying wasn't correct. So we started searching for actors who actually knew how to speak Japanese, and Johan felt that he could find a few people to wrap up that part of it. But we're going to do another session with an actual Japanese guy. Um, cool. I mean, we know because we heard the performances if you've got, so we want to try and match that, yeah. but just get a bit of a better quality. Meanwhile, Edward had created a really solid music foundation, and Mornay Moray had likewise done the same with the sound design. So I purchased a library with all the genuine models that's in yeah. the, the, um, the short. And I've, um, I've got a plugin called Igniter and I've chopped up all the sounds and made loops of it. And then inside the program, you can actually play with it like an instrument. You can play it with a keyboard, a MIDI, you can take your mouse and you can drag it where it should be. It's really awesome. It's, like flying a plane. it's basically flying your own plane. <laughs> And then also I have um, I've another plugin called Turbine, which I've done all the flybys while well, layered. Um, there's still a lot of other layers over it, but to get that that shoof flyby sound and to just to make it a little bit more cinematic. Although Turbine doesn't have the real airplanes, but I layer it with the real one to make it feel very much like um, in an in a open spa space, like in a 5.1 setup. So if I take this specific layer, I can show you what I've, just a rough estimate, so I can put the thrust up. And then what I've done is, you can take that, that's the airplane, and you can fly it around. But now, I'm going to go in between. This was what I've done with the flyby. Yeah, so let me play you what we came up with here. Of course, we layered that with a lot of other sounds. Um, I mean, there's a cannon hit in there just to give a little bit more of a cinematic feel. And I know the airplane doesn't fly, fly that fast, but that's what makes cinema so great is to make, let the viewer get into the story and think, wow, this is an awesome airplane. Um, it's basically you just climb a little bit into the engine. Obviously, there's a few ideas and few th uh, th thematic um, pieces of, of music that I kind of pull through the, the whole arrangement. I guess my process is just to like let it rise and fall on, on the moments and use that, that thematic content to kind of just create uh, um, the ever-flowing score just to kind of complement the action quite a lot and um, just work on those, those moments. Because we work in the same building, um, we would sit together and we will brainstorm whatever we want to do. We'll maybe work a few days um, on what we've discussed, don't listen to each other's work, get together, put it just together without a mix just to see how the instruments and the, and the sound design work with each other. Well, what I experimented a lot with is how would an airplane sound in a musical sense. Um, I know Mornay did a lot of awesome sound design to kind of get that realism with, with the airplane engines. Most of my sounds, um, I would say 80%, is recorded in studio, um, a little bit outside of studio where we need something specific that we can't manage to, to recreate here. Um, and also with Foley, you don't have to do the exact same or use the exact same thing to create something. For instance, if somebody walks on grass, what we've used is like in the jungle scene, although it's very soft in the mix, I take a, a cassette and I unwind all the, the tape and that tape sound. That's basically how we get, got the crunch of the dry leaves and stuff like that. I know Rob was very specific about the gunshots and I went to listen and I asked a few people around that also um, were flying and experienced some, some shooting in the air and they basically directed me to um, a sink, like you know what you get on, on, on a rooftop? Yeah, so outside of my studio we actually have a plate um, and I took a hammer and I banged it a few times. <laughs> And then, of course, afterwards, I took it inside the session, cut it up and laid it up with wherever the shots were. Basically, what Foley comes to is everything you see on screen, like the walking, the clothing, you get prop Foley. So say, for instance, I go with my hand to the mouse, I pick it up, 
And uh, although it doesn't sound like a sound, but in cinema, that's also, that's a prop foley. Footsteps, when you walk, anything that you see that's basically realistic, that's foley. For me, it was kind of just building a few synths and um, sound palettes and stuff to kind of imitate that, you know, like a plane crashing that like, uh, um, what do you call it, the pitch drop and um, uh, what type of sound, um, you know, that would be. Um, obviously, Sawtooth works quite well, and then from there on, you just you know layer it and, and add a nice processing chain to kind of make it really sit and and imitate that that movement for for the airplane. And that was kind of my idea, just to bring that in, and you know just support those those moments and let it work nicely with the sound design as well. Our initial thoughts was to create something that makes space for each other. It's almost like a story. It's a call and answer. Um, I like to say that, and they love to use that in dubstep music, where an instrument they call, wop, 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 and another one answers. And that's what makes that genre of music very interesting. It's not a guitar and a bass and a vocal playing boop, 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 like in the old school days, which I love, don't get, get me wrong, but you, I, I just feel technology needs to involve and techniques and the way we approach films. So what we've done is we, look, I'm a big fan of pauses and even silence. Um, so what, what we've tried to achieve was to create music and sound maybe, and then the sound comes and then the music takes over and then maybe boop, there's a pause, bam, gunshots comes through. And that's what makes everything cinematic. Mornay and Edward would send me mixes to approve or comment on, and then they'd make required changes and get the new mixes to me to drop into the work-in-progress edit. Meanwhile, using an online collaboration tool called F-Track, I would likewise get regular updates from the animation team with camera angle shots, new props, and animations to approve. It was very exciting to see the project slowly starting to take shape, with new components being sent to me nearly every week for approval and integration into the new edits that I was making as we went along. And in this shot right here, th this plane's going to crash right into our eyeballs. You know, he he's, he, okay. he's on fire and he's coming right at us. So you know, shift the angle a little bit you know, to the right, I guess. Or, okay. Um, and so the the zero that's on fire comes right at us. Okay. Um, uh, and then we see uh, Kane will fly off to this angle right here. Lieutenant okay. Kane, and we'll and we'll see the other guy making his his loop up here, because we cut okay. we cut from that to this. So yeah, he's so the audience gets an idea of what's happening here. We we're off to a great start with everything when COVID hit. This project was supposed to be done a year ago, but between COVID and political unrest and problems with ongoing electrical blackouts and a wide variety of other unforeseen issues in 2020. It caused many delays for us. But even though it took a lot longer than any of us anticipated, I feel it's been well worth the wait. And I cannot possibly thank everyone who worked on this project enough. They all brought their A-game to the table, and I believe it really shows in the final product. So to them and to those who contributed financially toward this project, thank you, thank you, thank you. You made a dream come true for me. Now, having said all that, what you're about to see needs to be considered simply as a proof-of-concept pilot. Even though I think it came out fantastically awesome, it's still not perfect. And ultimately, it's not supposed to be. What we've attempted to do here is set the bar for our minimum level of quality, meaning anything we do after this is only going to get better and better. So as you watch the following presentation, knowing what all went into this and what we were able to do with the budget that we had, imagine what we could do with 10 times more. Yes, Ultimately, this stuff is less expensive than live action, but let's face it, it's still expensive. By way of comparison, Star Wars, the Clone Wars animated series, those episodes were 26 minutes long and had a budget of $1 to $3 million each. And frankly, if I may say so myself, I think our animations ultimately look better than what they did. And they also had about 250 people working on each episode, which is 10 times as much as we had. So with all this in mind, each episode of Seed is going to be just under one hour in length, and our budget is projected to be 3 to $4 million per episode, which is still comparable to the low-end budget of most shows currently on TV today. Actually, our budget is a lot less when you consider the fact that shows like The Mandalorian, which is also under 30 minutes in length, cost upwards of $15 million per episode. All this to say, 
Please keep all these things in mind as you watch what we've done here and imagine what we could do if we had the budget and manpower to compete with shows already on the air, which are having an impact on our culture. We have a big message to share here, but it's going to take all of us working together to do it. In conclusion, what is SEED about? Well, it's about all the research I've done and become known for over the past 20 years. I pitch it as Lost meets the unit wrapped up in the X-Files, and it's meant to be the vehicle to package all of my research and that of others into a cool and entertaining fact-based fictional narrative that truly has the potential to reach the world with a powerful message. That's the big vision, and here we are at the first stage in seeing it manifest. So without further delay, here is the very first piece of the series titled Seed Paradise Lost, the teaser for episode one. to believe monsters were only the product of fairy tales and myth. I was wrong. Hell's kitchen, eh, Thompson? <laughs> you kidding? This place looks like paradise by comparison. I heard that. Yeah, let's hope it stays that way. All right, boys. It's getting late. Got everything we need? Yeah, I think so. Okay. I'm heading back. You know, I was thinking, maybe after the war we can... Uh-oh. What's the matter? We got company. Looks like a couple Zeeks. Where? Six o'clock high. I don't think they've spotted us yet, though. Yeah, with any luck, they're out of fuel and headed back to Rabal. We better get a grid on this. Ozzy want to know we've got contact this far south. Way ahead of you, boss. Alrighty. Keep an eye on him, Cat. I'm gonna... Scratch that. We got incoming. Whose bright idea was it to send us here without a wingman? Let's cut the chatter. Let him have a cat. Roger that. Okay. You want some of this, huh? Come on, kid! If this data gets into the wrong hands, it'll all be for nothing. I know. Just hang on. I'm maneuvering us over deeper waters. You know what to do. On it. Better make it fast. They're closing in on us. Use it to our advantage. Hang on, cat. See if I can kick her in a skid. That should give you a nice broadside. Got it. Thompson, get ready to drop. Homing beacon set. Opening bay doors. Okay. Here we go. Stand by. Package deployed. Closing her up. Carolano, 
We're turning into Swiss cheese here. I know, I know. I've got a misfire. Feeder's jam. Great. Thompson, can you get a shot? No, he's too high. I can't get a shot. Ah! Losing her. Brace yourselves, we're going down. Thompson? You guys still with me? Hey! Hey! Anybody? Gotta get out of here before she blows! Come on! <coughs> Come on! Carlano? Hey, you still with me, buddy? Come on, we gotta get out of here, man. Cat? I think at that moment, we both realized enough blood had already been shed. Our friends were gone. Paradise was lost. Perhaps we weren't the real enemy after all. 